Hello, and welcome to the Spec Shaman Podcast, a show that explores the world of building product manufacturers, architects, and engineers, sustainable design, and technology and trends. We engage in thought provoking discussions with renowned experts, industry pioneers, and visionaries who are making a significant impact in the construction industry. Join us as we explore groundbreaking ideas, revolutionary concepts, and the latest advancements shaping the built environment. The Spec Shaman Podcast is hosted by Laura Elliott, the lead instructional designer at Ron Blank and Associates. Laura is a seasoned interviewer with a passion for uncovering the untold stories behind success. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode. Let's get started. Well, hi, and welcome to another edition of the Spec Shaman podcast. Today, we are here with Yakari Kubo, a material specialist and licensed architect with Brightwork Sustainability. Hi, Yakari. Welcome. Hi, Laura. Thank you. I'm super excited to be talking to you. Thank you for having me. Yes, we're really excited to have you here. Brad and Tara Blank uh, recommended you very early on as someone that we should definitely have a conversation with. So we're glad to have you here. Um, We're going to go ahead and get started. So in your career, you have become an agent of change. What inspired you to work in the field that you are in? Um, I think that it probably starts with the fact that my mother was a biologist and she was constantly taking us on long walks through the fields of, I grew up basically in Indiana, um, identifying all the plants and really talking about their um, life cycles and getting us really steeped in appreciation of kind of the natural world. And then my dad, actually, he was an engineer um, and he focused the early part of his career on creating more efficient diesel engines. And then he shifted halfway through to kind of doing large scale solar projects for like larger communities. And I was really steeped in these kind of different aspects um, my entire youth. And then I think probably seventh grade was the first time we in my small town celebrated Earth Day. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And just that culmination of all those different things, I just fell in love with just this idea of kind of celebrating the earth and kind of trying to preserve it. And I knew at that point that that's really the direction I kind of wanted to go with my, with my studies. Those are great foundational moments to grow up in. Um, I think long walks in a, in a good field do a lot yeah. for the mind and for inspiration. So I definitely understand that. And that must've been so cool to see your father, uh, design and make the things that he was making. That's very, very cool. Um, That's an interesting pivot point too, I think, because we've been talking a lot lately about sustainable practices across industries and how things are starting to really shift. What new traction are you noticing in this field that really stands out to you? Uh, I think that just, I've been focus on sustainable building and sustainable environments basically since I started my kind of education and kind of since the architectural kind of work. I'm noticing now in terms of the entire industry that more large scale clients are coming to us and saying, hey, we've made these huge commitments. We really need you guys to help us realize these commitments. And I think there's been a a lot of support and this groundswell of kind of knowledge and education and the clients really driving this change, which has been Mm -hmm. uh, really exciting and interesting to see um, and and different from before. I felt like we were constantly having to go to the clients and explain about the issues and kind of like (laughs) get them to understand why it's important. But this feels like there's been a shift. They understand this is important and they're just trying like, how can we get there? Please like you know, point us in the right directions. Yeah, I definitely think that that's a great, it's a great note, because there has definitely been a pivot that's been going on where it was first, a lot of people trying to push them into it. And now they're saying, Mm -hmm. you know, hey, please help us. Why do you think the building product manufacturers should care and become involved in mitigating carbon emissions specifically? I think this is a really good Good point. Um, I think manufacturers um, should care because what I'm from what I'm seeing, um, I'm finding it that clients are choosing manufacturers that have client carbon data for their products. And so quite frankly, in order to even get specified onto a project, clients and um, consultants are looking for manufacturers and products that have 
quantifiable carbon data, or at least have been showing how they're trying to mitigate their carbon impacts. I think it's important to note that like clients are feeling a lot of pressure, like there's a lot of urgency with this because they're feeling a lot of pressure from many different sources in order to demonstrate the reductions in their carbon impacts Mm -hmm. from anywhere from like the government that we were seeing more and more policy and building code changes. And so in order to kind of get in front of that, clients are starting to shift the way that they're doing their business to make sure that once these policies become active, that they are kind of continuing to be able to build and not stopping in their tracks. I think that there's a lot of pressure from financial investments. Mm -hmm. Um, Investors are wanting to see like kind of the environmental, social and government's reporting and embodied carbon is part of that. Yeah. Um, And then customers are also really demanding. um, You know, they're looking for those little logos you'll see on Amazon. It says client you know, carbon neutral mm-hmm. like customers are really pushing for this too. Mm-hmm. And then um, on top of all that, there's a lot of internal pressures for setting their own goals. I think like, yeah. for example, yeah, the AIA has the 2030 challenge. So even if the client isn't directly asking for lower carbon materials, like the architect themselves might have these internal goals. And so they're yeah. going to choose the drywall, which has the lowest embodied carbon that they're finding. Um, Mm -hmm. And the client might not even know it. So I think there's a lot of pressure that's happening Mm -hmm. right now. And um, because of that, it's really important, I think, for manufacturers to kind of jump on board with everyone else to make sure that their product is going to be considered. Mm -hmm. Um, That is the easiest way for them to be able to kind of be involved in this process. I've seen clients just completely say, well, do they have a, a carbon data? No. Okay. well, then let's just go with these other product manufacturers. Yeah, and it's kind of yeah, it's kind of it's kind of sad in a way because we want to make sure that we have the most choices out there. Um, it's also important for the entire industry to understand, like if there's only one manufacturer that's produced carbon data, then that really skews our understanding of mm. the carbon impacts in general of that one kind of material. So if that manufacturer happens to be really high in their carbon impacts, then suddenly we were like, well, you know because of that data, let's kind of stay away from that product in general without kind of no understanding that other manufacturers might be doing things differently. So I think there's a lot of different ways that it's really involved for them to come to the table and be part of this conversation so that we can really have an informed kind of decision-making process. Yeah, we're turning a big ship, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you can't just hit the 90 degree right away. And I think that, I think that those are really great points that you're, you're bringing out that there's, there's a lot of different places that the shift is happening, you know, um, and it's impacting every level of the design process and the, and the construction process and, you know, the production of the, of the components that go into that. Um, when we're when building product manufacturers are looking to reduce their carbon footprint, like so they've decided that they want to do it for whatever, you know, whatever mm-hmm. pressure point spoke to them the most, right? Um, what are tangible ways that they can reduce that carbon footprint? Uh, I think that um, when it comes to your carbon footprint, um, understanding what your carbon carbon footprint is, is kind of the first step. Mm -hmm. So kind of knowing what goes into your supply chain, because the, your, the manufacturer's operational carbon is kind of the products, uh, embodied carbon. So when a manufacturer reduces their operational carbon, then they are reducing that kind of products impact. Mm -hmm. Um, and then also like, um, raw material sourcing. So that also is part of the um, the embodied footprint. So mm-hmm. kind of thinking about where you're getting your raw materials. Is there a way to increase the amount of recycled content? Is there a way to um, increase bio-based content? Um, or can you select from a material supplier that has mitigated their operational carbon? Because mm-hmm. it kind of all goes down the line. It's like a product's embodied carbon is the sum of all the energy and emissions associated with the kind of supply chain from the very ex- beginning extraction of that material from wherever it came from, the, the earth, and then through that manufacturing process. Mm-hmm. So really having an understanding of that and trying to kind of reduce that all every step along the way can really make a huge difference. 
I think um, also like installing solar panels can also mm -hmm. help like understanding where your uh, fuel source is coming from, where the, the energy grid of where you're manufacturing has a significant impact on um, your carbon footprint as well. Yeah, those are really uh, instrumental ways to to start that process and to really um, I think I think there's definitely also like a, just a point on the nuances of the carbon footprint altogether. And um, I know that we're always trying to generate resources, whether we're embedding it into our, you know, standard Ron Blank material or if we're working with Green CE, we're always trying to offer um, those those points of understanding, because it is a very complex set of, of ways to reduce the carbon footprint. And mm -hmm. sometimes yeah. I'll notice a building product manufacturer will discount themselves, <laughs> you know, before, mm -hmm. you know, and they shouldn't be because some part of their process is actually really, you know, contributing to reducing the carbon footprint. And mm -hmm. so it's, it's about making them kind of aware of, you know, where they're really succeeding already, and then, you know, helping them with their next steps in that. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's really now, when we're looking at the carbon emissions related documentation for building product manufacturers, you know, what do they need for design professional professionals to specify their products for sustainable buildings? What kind of documentation will help with that? I think the most important thing that a manufacturer can produce is a product specific type three EPD. EPD mm -hmm. stands for environmental product declaration. Mm -hmm. um, the type three means it's been third party verified and that can just help build the trust in that someone has externally looked at it, reviewed all the information and made sure that it's aligning with the standards that are consistent across that industry. So we can compare or at least try to be better at comparing apples to apples when it comes to the carbon um, numbers reported. Um, but I think that process starts with you have to create a life cycle assessment for your product. Mm. And then from there, you can create an EPD, which is kind of like a, a cliff notes version of the LCA. <laughs> and that uh, EPD can then be, um, it's very shareable, and it can be uploaded on any kind of like database website. Um, and that's really where uh, architects, designers, and consultants, we all start looking kind of to see what's uploaded, what kind of EPDs are available. That's really where the search starts so that um, they can specify the lowest carbon products. Yeah, that definitely, that EPD I know really resonates a lot. I wonder if we'll ever hit a point where that's a requirement. Do you think that that's something that might occur? I think so. I think in many industries, or at least we'll, we're seeing um, requirements around, or policies starting to come into place with requirements around you have to have X number of EPDs mm -hmm. for the pro the project. I think in California, even they might be starting to require EPDs for steel and concrete. Mm -hmm. um, luckily, those industries have been very proactive. I have one concrete manufacturer. We we give them the mix, and they generate an EPD kind of on the fly. They're really capable of doing that. I think mm -hmm. because of how impactful concrete and steel is. Um, mm -hmm. I yeah, I think that that's safe to say. And I, I and I know that there's like I think we, I know that the the creation of EPDs can be expensive. Uh, there's various yeah. ways that manufacturers can do it. You can lump several products into one EPD. So you don't have to have just, you know, spend the, however much it is on one product for every single one of your products. You can, you can do a group of products, a group of manufacturing facilities, because we know that a lot of manufacturers have facilities in various locations across the U S so you can lump those together um, you can also get together with some of your other uh, manufacturers in the same industry and you can pool resources and create an EPD for the five of you or the industry mm. as a whole. Um, those are really helpful too. There, it's it's nicer to have a very specific product specific EPD, but if um if we can at least get a ballpark understanding uh. for where the industry is like even just tile manufacturing at large in the United States, like mm -hmm. what is the general kind of um, range of carbon impacts? Like that is extremely helpful for decision-making and kind yeah. of pushing our understanding of what it takes to build a building and what kind of carbon impacts does a building have? Um, it's, it's, it's very important. Do you think that there's some trepidation in doing that? So for like a group of manufacturers, right? Or do you think that there there's a hesitancy because they're concerned that the outcome of the report, the EPD won't be good for them? 
or because I mean, I, I guess I guess what I'm thinking is that, you know, we have to we have to establish right. We need to create the baseline for where we're mm-hmm. at before yeah. we create the shift. So, um, you know, how do we how do we give assurance to those manufacturers so that they they're you know, I know we're talking about the point of um, where the shift is coming from and why it's happening. But like, I can imagine that moment where they're like, well, we don't, <laughs> you know, it might not be a good result for us, you know, but I think, I think it's important to establish the baseline. Do you think that that's, you know, uh, a mm-hmm. good point? Oh, definitely. And I think that w- we're, you might be surprised at how many um, industries there is no data yeah there so it's like you might be the first uh in your industry or you might be the second um and if you e- are even making an attempt like that speaks yeah. volumes to clients like even if you have right. a high um embodied carbon compared to another another manufacturer you know oftentimes we really will dive into those EPDs to really see why this manufacturer has a higher um, Mm -hmm. carbon impact than the other one. And then when you kind of start digging in, you might see all these other benefits that this other manufacturer is doing that actually um, you could, you could justify why you would specify that even though the kind of outputs. And, and I think in general, the reporting is um, still being refined. Yeah. And so sometimes we'll see in APDs like um, some manufacturers taking credit for off byproducts, you know, that are being made, and so that's showing as being a reduction in their GWP. But mm-hmm. other manufacturers aren't taking credit for that same kind of byproduct that's being made. So if you can kind of, so we are really diving to look at those nuances. Yeah. Because then if you readjust the numbers for kind of offsetting that by, that that byproduct, then suddenly the numbers might look closer to be right Um, I have more recently we were looking at some tile and one of the tile manufacturers had a lot higher GWP than the others and we kind of dove in and we saw all the other positive um, things that this other manufacturer is doing in terms of like taking back their tile they had reclamation programs they had Mm -hmm. a huge amount of recycled content like there were all of these other and part of the main driver was kind of the grid that they were kind of pulling their energy from. And so when you look at things like that, like suddenly that manufacturer that has a higher GWP actually is um, potentially more um, recommendable, you know, because they are doing other things. So then how do we get that information to the design professionals and stakeholders that are making the decisions to choose which manufacturer to work with? You know, it's, it's almost like the messaging of the EPD is an immense value and you have to have somebody that understands has a command right to give that information to the design professionals yeah i feel like that's what i do <laughs> on a daily basis so <laughs> work with us right <laughs> um it's true it's true there's not a lot of it's it, you really have to dive in and, and understand the process it's like a lot of teams that i work with they just can't even understand how to search for a DPT, DPD. yeah so, like I'll find twice as many EPDs on the market than they will because I know exactly how to search for them and how to find them. I think that's a really important point actually also for manufacturers. If you do create an, if you create an EPD, make sure the person or the team that you're working with um, doesn't have any limits on the shareability of uh, your EPD because sometimes um, that'll be a default checkbox. It'll say, we're not going to share this. And so then the only way someone can find it is if they go to your website. Mm -hmm. But if you make sure that there's no limitations on sharing and then it gets, uh, and then it's capable of getting uploaded onto a database like Toxnot or Mm -hmm. Ecomedes, then design professionals will be able to actually search for it on the sites like EC3 or Mm -hmm. um, sustainable minds, like places that we go to, to look for EPDs. Yeah, that's a, that's a real value. Thanks for sharing that with our audience. I think that people (laughs) are going to be writing some things down now. Um, When we're looking, I want to take it back a little bit to the carbon emissions when we're, when we're trying to prioritize. So, you know, if we're looking at, you know, what, what do we, what do we want to reduce the operational or embodied carbon emissions? Which one do you find to be more important or is it a tandem effort? Um, For manufacturers or just in general for building? I think for building product manufacturers. 
Yeah, I think for building product manufacturers, as we kind of mentioned um, before, it's like a product's reportable GWP or embodied carbon really is the operational carbon of the manufacturer um, and the operational carbon of the raw material extraction. So I think for them to focus on their operational carbon and their efficiency and their systems and stuff is is hugely impactful on uh, the embodied carbon. We see like in the steel industry, their raw material sourcing, if they get uh, more recycled content, that is significant. It's hugely significant. It can over half the amount of um, impacts. So I think looking towards reintegration of recycled materials or even your own materials, um, hmm. where you get your materials from makes a huge difference as well for the GWP. So thinking about take back programs, I think that's something that uh, we're finding um, can really make a difference is if you have a take back program and if you're able to reintegrate your old product, like even 100% or even partially into your new products, that kind of circularity component is really impactful as well as mm -hmm. kind of reducing your operational um, energy use. Yeah, circularity is a, is a big deal. <laughs> uh, <laughs> absolutely. When we're when you're trying to guide a design professional that's working on a project that really wants to mitigate carbon emissions, whether we're doing operational or carbon, wh what advice would you give to them on how the how to select the products that they're going to put into into a design? Um, well, with the design professionals, I think we kind of start with looking at um, bio-based products like what kind of where are there opportunities to integrate more bio-based products because um they just inherently have less carbon impacts um and then when it comes to then selecting other things i think finding epds is the easiest way mm -hmm. um to be able to start um maybe uh, start reducing your carbon impact so there are databases, like I mentioned before, like Mindful Materials or EC3, which is the Embodied Carbon in Construction Calculator. Mm -hmm. And um, these, these databases basically will list, um, you can type in flooring and it will list all the manufacturers that have EPDs. And then you can even rank them by the GWP values. So mm -hmm. like the lowest to highest. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times there, it's not, like the EC3 isn't super refined in the way that the product is being used. So, mm -hmm. you know, you'll have some really low carbon ma materials, but they're just not for the same use as what, you know, you're, you're actually looking for. So there's some kind of um, deeper diving that you have to go into there. But I think that is, that's where most um, designers are looking. They're looking in these databases to see um, and then we're, we're actually actually doing a lot of specification writing. Okay. Um, so that's a new trend too. It's like setting carbon limits for product types, um, or saying, uh, or or writing three different manufacturers that meet kind of the oh. GWP limits and stuff. So we we're involved in a lot of that, mm -hmm. um, and that seems to be where a lot of big clients that we're working with are going. They're like, please just help us understand what a good carbon limit is, or write in there say, hey, you know, if you can't achieve this, like. At the time of kind of closeout, have a plan to make a P EPD or have a plan for how you're mitigating your carbon impacts. Because we understand that there's a lot, it's difficult, you know, it's difficult to start this process of getting an EPD. So we're trying to make it as flexible as possible. The clients understand that um, it's a big ask. And we've been asking for a lot of things over the years, like from <laughs> as, as kind of our sustainability goals have shifted and our focuses have have uh, come into new focuses have come into light. We we are routinely asking for certifications and things, and we understand that. So we really want to work with manufacturers to 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 help you know push this forward. And I imagine it's got to be like an evolutionary process as well, right? Because if you're you know for writing for this month, you know the specification goals for you know or the the you know specifying for the carbon goals of a product. In two years, you know, as more industries sign on and create better, more sustainable practices and a higher performing, you know, circularity, we're going to be able to accomplish more. So that's going to have its adjustment period as well. And I um, 
I look forward to understanding how we're going to apply those evolutions, you know, the experts that will come out of, of, you know, saying that we're at a great, you know, we were at a great starting point two years ago, but now things, you know, we're understanding it better and better and how to apply it. Um, and as, you know, entire industry shift, you know, it, that's going to affect um, the specification of the efforts that they're making, you know, and mm-hmm. it'll probably create more competition between products, <laughs> you know, because if yeah, you, if you just have the, you have three, you know, manufacturers that are producing something that's, you know, you know, fitting into that sustainability goal. Um, you know, if 10 more of manufacturers join, then, you know, you're going to create a bigger market for that. And that's, you know, I think, is that a goal that we have, you know, just to, to create oh, definitely. products within the same yeah. category? Definitely. I find it, I, I'm constantly reaching out and searching for more products that mm-hmm. we can <laughs> that we can specify. I can't yeah. emphasize enough how much I really want more manufacturers to make carbon data and just yeah. make the data, just get an understanding for what your impacts are. Because right now I'm kind of, I feel it's very limiting to only be able to specify or say, well, these two carpet manufacturers meet, you know, your, yeah. your yeah, limits because, because there's so much pressure on clients to, to meet their goals. I mean, just, mm-hmm. yeah financial financial pressures you know yeah that that they really are coming to us saying we don't care like just give us the number one manufacturer that has the best data you know and and, right. and that's not something that we typically hear like you know usually they're like wanting to be more sensitive to the design but i'm finding that there's a lot more pressure to kind of just hey we want the lowest you know just give us the one that's needing that and so i think that if there's more there's more data out there, then we can just be smarter in our choices and we can promote more, you know, manufacturers to, to, to kind of get involved in this. Um, I, yeah, yeah I think it's only a good thing. <laughs> yeah. Cause yeah. At, at this point, some, some manufacturers are just cornering the market, <laughs> you know, so exactly a pretty it's good incentive true. to, you know, get those declarations made so that you can join that, that market and create more competition. So I know you mentioned the concrete and steel industry a little bit ago. How do they fit into the carbon emissions landscape since they are the primary contributors of many of the issues that we're facing? Yeah, I mean, they are. It's just amazing to see kind of the way that they're pushing forward because they have such bad reputation. I mean, (laughs) I mean, you know, as we've all kind of probably heard the statistics that if concrete was a country, it'd be third behind the U.S. and China in terms of its greenhouse gas emissions. Wow, Concrete recognizes that it has an issue. And I think that they've been very innovative. I mean, there's just been so many. I think there's a lot of opportunities, too, actually, because of that with manufacturers to really get grants or find financial Mm -hmm. backing to try and push their production in new ways. You know, Mm -hmm. I know that like, um, even after this kind of discussion, we're meeting with a a concrete manufacturer, I think what is their, uh, oh, Secrete Technologies. And Mm -hmm. they basically developed this new kind of nanotechnology, zeolite based concrete, Mm -hmm. which is completely cement free. Um, wow. And they've used it on a project in Seattle. And so I, I just there's so many um, new companies creeping up that are trying to mitigate this. I think it's a really exciting time, actually, mm-hmm. for those industries and some concrete and steel to really um, be pushing for 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 new technologies. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. So then, and then let's pivot over to wood. How do they fit in the carbon emission <laughs> strategies? Let's just hit them all. <laughs> what are the yeah. different views on the wood products and carbon sequestration? Yeah, wood is an interesting one because, uh, you know, uh, there's several just kind of tips I think about wood. Um, mm-hmm. The FSC certification and understanding that your wood is sustainably forest is hugely important Yeah. Um, to just making sure that the sequestration benefits of wood are be actually realized. Um, so understanding the timber source, the forestry practices, and the s- sourcing for the wood products um, for construction is critical in understanding yeah. That the um, use of wood is consistent with the intended climate or you know desired um, environmental and social benefits because you don't want to go in there and pr- help 
source wood that's deforesting kind of a whole area because forests, of course, are really key in, in kind of absorbing CO2 from the atmosphere. Um, there have been studies, I think in 2018, there was a study by EcoTrust and the University of Washington, which demonstrated that FSC certified forests, at least in the Oregon and Washington region, um, had the ability to store more than 30%, 30% more carbon than just a standard forest. Oh, wow. So I think our first our first kind of recommendation is like any wood that you buy, try to get the get FSC certified wood because it's the only way we can really um or or other sustainably forest kind of certification is that that doesn't contribute to deforestation or cause other environmental degradations and that um it is you know gonna be um sequestering more carbon, I think. Because unfortunately, the wood, which is also interesting, the wood industry doesn't have a lot of um, carbon data out there. They, they're they one industry that hasn't really created a lot of EPDs. Hmm. So our kind of knowledge of the carbon impacts of wood kind of go with, well, if it's um, FSC certified or the harder or more denser the wood is, the more carbon it has sequestered. The faster growing things also have sequestered more wood. So like poplar or like bamboo, they've sequestered more carbon, but um, there's not a lot of like EPDs out there to do that direct comparison. I think, um, yeah, I think wood also is a little tricky because you get those sequestration benefits, the kind of biocarbon benefits, but the, but those benefits only last as long as the wood is intact or in use. Mm -hmm. So the minute you start mulching it or burning it, or you know, letting it decompose, all of that stored carbon is really released into the atmosphere. Yeah. So I think that a lot of times when we do our comparison comparisons to products, we'll make a note that there are those sequestration kind of bio, those kind of benefits. But we like to look at how much energy goes into the processing of that wood, mm-hmm. um, just to be more fair when you're kind of because because we don't know what's going to happen at the end of life, like. We, they yeah. could tear it out in a week, in a week and burn it, you know, and then suddenly, well, that wasn't beneficial at all. It probably would have been better to choose a different material. Oh, it sounds like an incomplete story. <laughs> it, 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 yeah, it is. It is. So um, I think that, um, oh, I forget what I was saying. <laughs> well, no, and I, mean, I think we're trying to think of like the creative strategies. So um turning over to buildings, can they become carbon storage sites by using carbon storing materials like biogenic or bio, bio-based materials as opposed to high emitting materials? Yeah, I think that the, the direction is going that way. Oh, I think I, I do remember what I was trying to say. Actually, <laughs> um, <laughs> It was the more raw and more like just raw you can keep your wood, the mm-hmm. better. So when you start turning it into plywood or MDF, then a lot of that sequester carbon is kind of released um, or the mm-hmm. and, and the amount of energy that you're using to kind of like press the wood together increases. So like a raw two by four, just solid, solid wood is like the best kind of way to use your wood. So a solid uh, FSC certified two by four is like the greatest kind of um, thing to use. Mm-hmm. I think that um, when it comes to um, using building as carbon storage, I think we definitely can. I think with the kind of shift to all this mass timber is really going to help, like thinking of where we can replace those high impact materials, like the corn shell um, materials and mm-hmm. concrete and steel and mm-hmm. glass. I don't know how we could, glass is just, is is not one we can really replace easily with a bio-based material currently. But um yeah, I think that I think that's the way the direction we're going. And I think sometimes policy is the thing that's kind of yeah the place where we're starting to shift that because, you know, the structural issues or fireproofing that life safety element, like not having wood so high. And I think we're already seeing that shifting. Mm-hmm. And I think there's a lot of possibility there. So it's it's exciting. Um, yeah, we did. We recently did a study with this. Um, um, and, and this makes total sense, but it was a. Uh, a mass timber office building and then we got a design for what it would look like if it wasn't mass timber and obviously the just the amount of concrete for the foundation was just like significantly less obviously it's with insane. the with the mass timber building because of weight it had less weight and so they were able to like half that kind of foundational kind of um needs 
And so there's a lot of kind of rippling effects. I think if you make your buildings lighter and using more kind of bio-based materials, you can you can reduce the reliance on those other heavier, more carbon intensive materials. Mm -hmm. This is all so fascinating. And you just you just mentioned policy and that really so like what does the future of carbon emissions policy and technology look like? I'm thinking, how do we get more people that really fully understand? Um, you know, what you're talking about, you know, I'm thinking about degrees <laughs> almost, you know, and I'm sure that they, you know, I know that they exist. I know that they're definitely like with law. I saw law kind of move over into this space about a decade ago. Um, I remember that moment, but what does the future of, of these policy decisions, especially because it's shifting, right? I mean, like you just mentioned, we don't really even have the carbon data on, on, on wood. Um, and, and so like, as we, we're in the data collection phase of our hypothesis, right? Like we're trying to yeah. build it together. So how does how does policy deal with those shifts, and um and also like technology? Because as yeah, I'm go ahead. This is a big oh question. no no go ahead. <laughs> it's like a break it down question. Right? <laughs> policy um, and technology are very separate, but they also often you can create policy around a technology, right? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think it's hard to make, you know, direct predictions kind of about what's going to happen because everything's shifting and moving and issues mm -hmm. change. And um, suddenly we have a concrete that doesn't need cement. And then, oh, well, that's solved that issue. You know, there's just yeah. like, so much going on. I think right now, like you're talking about, like, well, basically, we do have this kind of looming deadline, right, of 2050 that we have to reach zero emissions by as a global community. And that's kind of like the, 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 that's the North Star of kind of the way that we're going. Right. And I think from where I'm sitting, like I see the kind of industry scrambling really to understand how to get there. And that includes technology and policy. Mm -hmm. And I think the most important thing is kind of that we're aligning our compasses in that right direction. Um, and, and I see that it is happening, like we're pushing in that common direction. And I see in time and time in the, in the past that we've able to galvanize as an industry and mm -hmm. as just a society and kind of make these tectonic shifts to it in this common direction and make significant impacts. Like, for example, CFC, you know, how we kind of realized that um, these chlorofluorocarbons were creating ozone like depletion and suddenly as the global community came together and did the Montreal protocol and now like actually the ozone layer is starting to heal itself so I think that mm -hmm. there's a lot of like I think that's something historically we've done and we've proven that we can do and I think that that's where we're going to go with this I know that like as you mentioned before we are still kind of in the data gathering stage of this kind mm -hmm. of carbon process and so like places like Toronto Toronto, Canada, they're starting to require like a whole building else life cycle um, analysis on their buildings. They're not really setting targets so much yet, but they're just requiring pro building projects submit kind of this their carbon data with their building product, with their building um, um, permitting kind of package. Yeah. So that's kind of where a lot of places are. We're like, hey, we just want you to submit your EPDs to us. We want to have, we want to know that you're kind of going that way. We want to have, um, well, the, some places are doing tax incentives. If you have X number of EPDs, like we'll give you a little tax break or there, there's a lot of different ways that um, they're crafting their policies. California, um, Denver, New Jersey, Vancouver, Toronto, these are kind of where things are really starting to actually um, push the policies into place. Mm -hmm. But it, we're seeing more and more places kind of do it and the way that they're doing it is a little different. Sometimes it is tax incentives, sometimes it is a requirement, sometimes uh, for, for proving or having a, a number of EPDs, and sometimes it is kind of a calculation of what your carbon impacts are. Um, but uh, as far as the shift goes, that seems to be the trend. Like that is definitely where things are going. And I think that um, we can't escape that currently. I think we need to like understand that's what's happening. <laughs> so an acceptance. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just say, okay, this is the way the ship is going. We got to jump on, you know, or we're kind of might miss the boat kind of thing. Um, yeah. An acceptance of the effort that needs to be made, you know, with yeah. a, with a, uh, you know, an understanding that, it's still in development, you know, and I think, I think that grace, you know, I think in it is, is an interesting component to consider because, you know, 
we just need to build the process of how we really achieve it um and and allow that grace to exist in that moment i think for everybody involved you know as long as there's a genuine effort being made oh definitely do you, yeah do you think that um will always be in a state of shifting i think that i mean i think that's that's human right always trying to <laughs> um perfect the progress right um and you know i think you mentioned the end point of 2050 um do you think that we'll still be working on this you know 50 years after that point but just in a new way to always make something better uh yeah i just think that's human nature so mm -hmm. like i think as humans kind of we have a long history of just kind of mm, wanting to tackle and understand and innovate you know in general you know i think when we're and then throughout while we're doing this we suddenly identify an issue and say whoa hey this is causing a problem you know so then right. we educate ourselves on that issue and the importance of why that issue is a problem and then we start innovating new technologies and way to deal with that issue um i think that's something that's consistent over we just do that over and over and over again and i think as long as humans kind of have an ambition to do this kind of discovery you know and create that we're going to continue to <laughs> grow our understanding of the world around us and identify new things to tackle. I'm hoping by 2050, like we're going to have this carbon stuff already figured out, you know, we're like, yeah. oh no, that was back in the night, 2030. <laughs> like we already, we fixed our processes. We're kind of on the go. Oh wait, now we've discovered this whole other issue. Like, like, I don't know, discovering in different materials on Mars or the moon or something. Yeah. Suddenly we have a whole new problem to deal with. Um, I, um, I'm trying to think. Oh, I forgot what I was going to say now. Sorry. <laughs> no. And I think that, I mean, I think that, you know, I've, I've said it a couple of times in the past, but we're really definitely a troubleshooting generation. And I think that's a very human um approach to always strive to make things better through the processes that you know we're putting into place um i definitely even even in, in a few years have seen pretty substantial change um yeah. so i think it's really an encouraging thing um to see all this progress being made and to see more and more components of the built environment come together, you know, whether you're a design professional or a building product manufacturer or somebody that specializes in it, in, in it, like you do, you know, even, even me and my little seat. Cause I think, I think the point here is just to try to inform people as much as possible and make it digestible also. Mm -hmm. Don't make it seem like this enormous issue that, you know, you can't bring your manufacturing process into um, there's space for, for everyone to become involved in it and it's happening, you know, whether you <laughs> like it or not. So, you know, um, yeah. and finding good partnerships too, you know, I think mm -hmm. that that's really a key, you know, partnerships with, you know, companies that really care about helping you with it. I know sustainable minds does a good job and mindful materials does as well. Like, you know, we're, you know, agents of change that really want to, you know, collaborate with everyone involved in the process. So. Yeah, no, I think those are all really great points. I think yeah, historically, there's always friction points along the way with these new shifts and we need to, you know, they're valid and important to listen to. We need to like take lessons learned from it. But I think generally, you know, as a society as a whole, we want to move towards we all do a healthier, more sustainable lifestyle that increases the length and quality of our lives and also improves and provides prosperity. And mm -hmm. I think that's always, that's kind of the general, like where we all kind of want to go, no matter where we are kind of within that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The noble mission. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's been a real pleasure to talk to you today. I can't thank you enough for taking time to share your in-depth knowledge on these topics with us. Um, I know that I learned a lot and our audience probably did as well. So we're really grateful for you and um, thank you so much. Oh, thank you. It's been really fun. I, I feel like there's just so much more we could talk about. I really enjoyed our, our conversation. So thank you so much. And I love the work that you guys are doing over there at the Base Green CE and podcast is, is fantastic so thank you i appreciate thank it you. we'll definitely have to have you back for season two <laughs> thank you so much Great. thank you thank you for listening to the spec shaman podcast 
If you enjoyed today's episode, please subscribe to our show and leave us a review. The Spec Shaman Podcast is produced by Laura Elliott and Brad Blank. A huge thank you to our guests who made this show possible. Building product manufacturers who want to increase their specification opportunities, please visit specshaman.com or ronblank.com. Thanks all for this episode, folks. See you next time.